the look of it. So that's pretty fun. Yeah. Thanks for coming today and thanks for everybody online. I don't know if you can see me. Oh. Hi. <laughs> Not really. No. Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. And this is awesome. We have online students joining. So the wonder yes. of technology. Yeah. yeah. And, um, Megan, can they hear you if you're not at the mic? Can you hear us if we're not at the mic? Um, yes. Okay. okay, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. uh, all, right. all right. So we are so excited to be talking about um, the trauma center and the work that we're doing. So I'm Dr. Megan Holmes. I'm co-director with Dr. Jenny King. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. And we have a number of our, um, our affiliates here to also jump in. So we have- Hello everybody, I'm Ivan Kennard. I'm a research associate. And he's an alumni of our college. I work with Megan and Jenny and Ivan. Carrie, same. <laughs> <laughs> So we, um, uh, so we don't have any slides today because we wanted to make this just informal. So we, what we thought we would tell you a bit about is our work with the Cleveland Recreation Centers and transforming them into trauma-informed recreation centers. Um, but we can also shift if you're interested in hearing something different. Um, we are very flexible. We brought regulation stations. Thank you for digging into them. Um, you are welcome to help yourself to fidget, um, whatever's in it that you play with, you're welcome to take. And um, we'll just go from there. Do you want to start with just the like where we began? Yeah, although I always get it wrong. 2018. Okay. So <laughs> it was the summer of 2018. <laughs> see pre COVID uh, is like very fuzzy with. Yeah. Um, in the summer of 2018, actually, probably before that, um, the then Mayor Frank Jackson um, put out legislation um, and really tried to kind of sound the alarm about the issue of trauma and toxic stress facing kids in the city of Cleveland and chose very wisely the city's 22 recreation centers as um, 21 plus <clears throat> two that aren't, yeah, so Cadell Fine Arts and yeah. Um, as potential sites of um, healing for kids in Cleveland, right? Outside of the school system, outside of juvenile system, outside of kind of all the existing systems, because kids um, show up there. Kids tend to feel pretty safe there. Um, so we got involved in two ways initially back in 2018. First was to perform an organizational assessment on each of the rec centers to see where they were and were not in line with trauma-informed principles. Um, and then we also provided training to all of the staff alongside the folks at Frontline Services to all of the rec center staff over the summer at that time. We had been telling them though, since 2018, <laughs> that training is not enough. And I think if, if this is an area that's interesting to you, um, it comes up pretty often that organizations want to become trained, organi organizations want to become trauma-informed, but there's not kind of a universal understanding of what that is. Um, so this next phase of the project, which do you want to talk about or pass to somebody else? Yeah. Yeah, so they, um, so after we kept saying like, we need to do organizational work in order to really see change, um, they came back to us and said, okay, we're ready. Like, we feel like our staff have a good foundation. And mind you, it was, the, everybody was trained. So the janitors, the people that sat at the front desk, the camp, the temporary camp people, all the way up to the commissioner of Parks and Recs, and even the director that oversees Parks and Recs and Water Works, I think, Director Cox, who it was, um, were all trained. And so we felt like there was a good foundation. We, um, what we ended up doing, which was guided by the then chief, um, Tracy Martin Thompson, to um, figure out a way to help the part, the recreation centers move towards becoming both trauma-informed 
and high quality. So in the world of parks and recs, are any of you, have any of you ever worked with recreation centers or at a recreation center? So there's um, like a whole accreditation process to become a nationally accredited parks and recs. Cleveland is not. Um, and there's not very many in Ohio. I think there's only two other recreation systems that are um, accredited. So we got to learn all new language around the um, 100 and I'm not going to say it right, 40 to 48 standards that are required. Um, and then overlay what it means to be trauma informed at the rec center. So what does that look like um, from the moment you walk into the door? Does it feel welcoming? Does it feel like it represents the culture and the identity of the community? Are there a number of different programs that are accessible? Um, are the policies written in a way that aren't threatening um, and accommodating? You know, there's all these layers to becoming trauma informed. So what one component um, that we are so excited to launch right now, we're right in the midst of launching it, is to develop a, um, it's like an assessment tool that uh, the managers and the regional managers can sit down and just go through saying um, whether they meet the criteria or not. And across nine domains of trauma-informed organizational um, domains. And um, that will then move into an improvement plan. And so we're, we just met with the uh, managers last week, this week, Monday. All of our <laughs> Monday, we met with them Monday. Um, and so we're, we're starting next week to go into the rec centers and actually help them collect the data um, and then interpret it of what does it mean? What can we do to improve it? So there's other components of it. Um, Amy Korsh Williams, is leading a component around becoming trauma-informed leaders. And I'll pass it over to you, Carrie, because you've been, I'm sorry, Emily, um, you've been working closely with Amy on that component. So for this level of work, we're mostly trying to create um, a tool that's more of like a guidance system for them to build competencies around being trauma-informed in a way that kind of intersects with what they do from day to day. So how to hold meetings that feel safe and welcoming and include all everyone's voices, um, how to interact with people that come into the centers, how to um, communicate with everybody. So it's really about competency building and we're also developing a tool, but the tool is really just, like I said, for guidance and for progress, for monitoring progress. And um, hopefully they'll just, they'll be able to over time build those skills that we have in this tool. So it sort of mirrors the larger thing that Megan was talking about. It's just more hyper-focused on the, the managers themselves because they're interfacing with people that come in. They're also interfacing with like the city administration and they're, so they're really that <coughs> through line on all levels of the rec centers. And the last component, I'll let you and Ivan talk about yeah, so another really exciting piece that actually um, came to be at the first phase, so back in 2018, and has just kind of shifted a little bit since then, um, is that the city hired, at the time, 13 um, social support specialists, so that each recreation center has a designated, we call them S3s because that's a lot of S's, <laughs> a designated S3 who is there to provide all types of supports to the kids and the families that engage with the RAC. And I will pass it to Ivan to talk a little bit about our work with them. Yeah, so uh, we've been meeting with them since, uh, I want to say, what, January? January. Yeah, January. So it's a group of uh, uh, 13, um, but over time, we've noticed that as we're supporting these rec centers become more trauma-informed uh, and looking at leadership styles, um, there's been some, some riggedness as pertains to how uh, these, these previous leadership styles, i.e. politics, um, have had their, their scope, right? So on um, the ideal um, time that we spend together, we, we meet uh, about uh, once a month um, for about three to four hours. Um, and, and ideally, we not only go over uh, Dr. Bruce Perry's uh, model on um, neurosequential model and just trauma-informed practices, but it's also shown to be like a peer support group um, for them to come together and kind of connect ideas and um, kind of um, game plan on how they can support each other while uh, working in what we call a trauma organized system where we're helping them move towards this more trauma informed, trauma responsive environment. 
Yeah, we've learned a lot from yeah, that about, yeah, yeah. <laughs> about politics and about um, just kind of the unique position of their, their city employees. Um, so there are not kind of the natural supports that are often in place if you're at a community mental health agency or a behavioral health agency. So um, it, there's a lot of opportunity for them because, you know, there's flexibility and they, they can adapt. But um, yeah, it's, it's, I think it's a challenge sometimes working in a political system in a way that's kind of the opposite of how things are supposed to happen. So we'll continue working with them. Um, through June of this year, at the very least, we're also going to be offering some additional training to the managers um, around trauma-informed leadership and some of the ways that they can integrate um, some of the work that Amy and Emily and her, her team are working on um, alongside some other leadership training that they've gotten from other entities. So we've got our hands in like all these different pots and um, it feels really good. It feels like it's, we're kind of at the point where it's been a long time coming, but things are starting to line up in a really nice way. And the, I'll add one more piece and then just open it up for um, questions and dialogue is that when, when we got asked to do this, we started talking to other recreation centers and really leaders in um, trauma-informed care across the nation. And they basically all said, this hasn't been done, so you're just going to have to create it. And so that's a lot of what we've done is trying to figure out, okay, what are the trauma-informed models, for example, that have worked in domestic violence shelters? How can we shift that to make it work in a recreation center? Um, you know, what are what are type of the type of questions that are already being asked about high quality uh, rec center? So, like regarding safety, and how can we pair that again with something that has more lens into the experiences of people walking into the door, not just that you know a fire extinguisher exists or they have a band aid kit. Um, so, some of those, like how do we create it, emotional and psychological safety within the environment? Um, for them. So it's been a really cool process. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's been kind of awesome to, to work with them for this long. Yeah, they, what we learned immediately was that every of the 22, 23 rec centers, every single one has its own culture, and is completely different from all of the others. And so that's kind of an added layer of complexity, but like an exciting one in terms of trying to figure out how to kind of make things a little bit more uniform across. Um, and yeah, like Megan said, you know, I think this is something truthfully, our team we've sort of lost sight of just because we've been like in the work for so long. But one of our colleagues um, at Cleveland State who's part of this project too, Dr. Dakota King-White, reminded us all the other day that this is like groundbreaking stuff. I mean, it, this will, offer a model that can be replicated for other systems and other types of um, natural community supports that are already existing to become more in line with trauma-informed stuff. So yeah, it's easy to lose sight of that, but it's exciting. The staff are great. Yes, they are great. We, in 2018, when we did these initial trainings, we actually collected some data on their um, adverse childhood experiences. So it was um, anonymous, so we don't know who you know, reported what, but we collected about adverse childhood experiences as well as the people in places that they felt support. And um, it is a highly um, traumatized group. They've experienced quite a bit higher than the average of adverse childhood experiences, but they also reported significant um, connections to community place and people. And most often marked was that the rec centers were a place of safety for them and rec center staff as they were growing up were important. And we just, we love to like remind the city of this because these employees are so important because a lot of them grew up as rec center kids and they found that that was their, that was where they could be protected. That's where they could be safe. And so they wanna give back by being in that position. Mm -hmm. so, pretty cool. Open it up for questions. Um, kind of two-parter. Why do you think Cleveland was the first city to decide to like make a trauma-informed like rec center? And do you think other cities are considering this as well, or is this like still just a you thing? <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, Cleveland has one of the highest violence rates. Bayer Jackson was very aware of that. 
um, his grandkids were in rec centers and he was seeing the impact of how um, supportive it was. There were a lot of people that came to the table to get it. So while he put the bill through, there were people even here at the university that were saying like, this is important. We need to move in this direction of creating a safe space for these kids and trauma-informed care is the way to go because it recognized that these, these kids have a history of traumatic experiences, but they're not their trauma. They're, you know, it's, it's helping the staff understand what happened to them so that they can better work with them. Yeah, um, so other systems, other rec, parks and rec systems across the country are beginning to have these conversations. And there are some, like Megan mentioned, we have colleagues in Chicago who have been doing trainings with their recreation staff and their other community partners, but it has stopped at the training piece. So I think what's what's innovative about this is kind of offering some structure around like the then what, which is often what happens after the training is people want more and they, you know, they're interested in aligning, but there's not really like a recipe for them to do that. So there are other major cities, Los Angeles, I know has done a lot of work with their um, rec centers and their violence interrupters. That's another piece we were able um, the rec centers in the city of Cleveland also partner with several um, violence interruption groups, and we were able to train them too. So that's that also I know is happening in Los Angeles, but after the training, there's not been much else going on. Boys and you're, we're seeing at some boys and girls clubs too. Mm -hmm. I think people are recognizing that it needs to be operating in all different spaces like schools and places where kids are naturally um, in order to really impact those kids' well-being. Something I heard mentioned is this idea of um, trying to kind of bring all the rec centers in Cleveland, despite them being different, to kind of a, a uniformality in this trauma that we're implementing. So something that we speak about in our community practices class is like, leveraging individual community assets. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm thinking about kind of that conversation and like how much we should be pushing for conformity and like in what ways that is benefiting the trauma informed practice, but then also keeping the individuality of what communities already treasure. Yeah, <laughs> I'm thinking about this, the assessment tool and the assessment process as being. Yeah, yeah, so th that's a really good, um, that's a really good question and bringing in coursework. I love it. Um, so, so yeah, so the, the tool is very much strength-based assets, what, what's in, what's currently in your um, building and the way that you operate your center. Um, the, the comment that Jenny made, I, um, we often talk about how the resources are not evenly distributed. And so part of our work um, is working directly with the centers, but also holding the city accountable for not distributing resources correctly or not responding to needs that they have been asking for. And so um, we don't anticipate that every center is going to be the same and they shouldn't be. Uh, and we actually are pushing for differences in programs right now. They deliver the same program across every rec center when we know that one community loves to play soccer and doesn't play basketball and another community loves to play basketball, doesn't play soccer, but yet both, both centers have to offer the same program. So really trying to um, help them better understand the community that they're in, in order to tailor it to their needs. Yeah. Ivan, do you have any, anything to add to that? You know, it's great. Yeah, it's really leveraging. Um, and I think during our meeting Monday, um, some of the regional leaders and managers kind of acknowledge that they're already doing things mm -hmm. that acknowledge yeah. the the, uh, the strives of trauma-informed practice. Um, so yeah, I don't think there's anything being changed. It's more so assessing what's going on and then kind of pushing them in the right direction to kind of sharpen what they learn. And it's interesting, they're very competitive with one another, yeah. um, which was not a piece I think that we were like fully aware of just how competitive they are with one another. Um, but because they're all going above and beyond, largely the managers and the staff are doing so much more than like what they are expected to do. But I think, you know, the each neighborhood, it's so it's sort of an anchor in each neighborhood. And so 
the programming, like Megan was saying, doesn't always match because that's like the one piece that's uniform <laughs> across all rec centers. But even within that, there have been um, the S3s and some of the other staff have built out their own programs to better match the community. So one of the folks that Ivan and I are working with, do you remember where? Oh, no, I was going to say boxing. Well, yeah, boxing yeah. Boxing. you talk about volleyball, I'll talk yeah. about boxing. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, one of the approaches that we, we talk about, you know, with the trauma form, like how do you get away from that cortex and just, you know, tap into that motion and movement um, rather than, you know, having, you know, talk therapy all the time. Um, so as, you know, uh, I think it's Renetta, she, mm -hmm. she, she implemented volleyball as a way to, you know what, okay, we can talk about what's going on, but let's, let's find out what do you enjoy doing, right? What, what's something that can get you mobile, um, that can build some type of community. And then from there, they were able to, you know, imp implement volleyball while still, you know, talking about some of the issues and peeling back layers as they had sessions. And now she has to coach. Yes, yeah, yeah, they're pulling her into right here, so she comes in our train like sore, gallon of water, exactly. Um, and one of the other folks noticed that a lot of the young men that he was working with were interested in boxing, so he um, submitted for external funding and yeah. got a little grant to get. Um, boxing equipment and some coaches available to the kids. So the programming piece, I think, is what um, ends up being very much neighborhood focused, community focused, and asset focused. Um, and our piece is more so thinking about policies and structures that can be put into place where it's just easier to create those things. Because some of these rec centers are beautiful. The one we were in the other day, usually the ones they hold big trainings at are these brand new remodeled top to bottom and others, you know, have holes in the floor and just are not in the same kind of physical state. So being able to advocate with the city to move things along a little faster to make access a little more equitable. Yeah, one of the, like a policy example that we discovered early on was around putting kids out. So um, kicking them out of the rec center, the policy is that they're kicked out for an entire week, every single rec center. And so if a kid comes in um, acting aggressive or yelling, the, the common way to handle it was to be like, all right, you're out for the week. Um, and then through the training, we were able to see some shifts in understanding that, you know, what that kid's bringing in has nothing to do with the rec center it's whatever happened outside or what's happening at home or what's happening at school. And um, there was this cool moment, story a hundred times, because I love it. Um, the, we had one of the trains we had asked them, um, you know, what did, did anything come up in from the past month? Did you notice anything different? And this um, one guy stood up and he's like, yeah, we had this situation where this kid came in and he was puffing up his chest and yelling. And I responded by like puffing up my chest and yelling at him. And then my buddy over here walked up to me and was like, hey man, toxic stuff. <laughs> 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 it was like, yeah, that's what's going on. And he caught, like he was able to connect it and said, hey, let's go bounce the ball. And they bounced the ball, played basketball. And going back to what Ivan was saying, like that connection to the mind-body movement, calm that kid down. So that's a like change in behavior to address a policy that's not great. We're trying to tackle that policy of changing it. What other ways can we help shift that policy that these kids aren't on the street for a week when they don't have anywhere else to go? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that story. I share it whenever I can share it, <laughs> especially when it goes to talks. <laughs> exactly. Any questions online? You can unmute or put your chat in question in the chat. I have a question, kind of changing topics. And Ivan, this is for you. <laughs> um, so can you just tell the group kind of when did you graduate from Mandel? And what was your journey to get from sitting in the classroom to this job? I can, I can do that. Uh, so yeah, I graduated last May, so 2021. Um, halfway through the program, I experienced that, that COVID transition. So that was a, you know, a hectic time, uh, but I saw it through, right? So persevered. Um, and then during that, uh, I 
first few months of studying for the, the licensure test um, was really just thinking through what did I want to do. So I did a mix between, um, so I got a certificate in nonprofit management, and then I was in between a community practice for social change and children, youth, and family. So my whole crux was how do I empower individuals to create um, a community that they want to see, right? Or or acknowledge that, hey, this is the space that we're in. How are we agents of change? So moving away from myself and empowering others. Um, so then from there, I actually had an opportunity to work with another alum. Her name is Monique um, Williams. Um, she has a consulting firm um, and I actually worked on a few projects impacting the Nicholas Foundation, um, Burton Bill Carr. So very uh, macro approach on uh, community development, um, and just uplifting community a wide voice. Um, so I think Dr. Joseph, he's still working on a project with Woodhill. So we had some, some uh, uh, phase work there with community engagement. Um, I don't know if anyone knows Miss uh, Marilyn Burns, but was able to develop a real good relationship with her and really just going back to that, that goal of mine of how do I uplift community voice. Um, from there, kind of not, not <laughs> learned my own ceiling, but um, it wasn't as not fulfilling, but I, I didn't really get to the crux of, of the goal, right? Um, so as I was learning more about myself, learning more about the field, um, I did a few different um, uh, gigs with my LSW, so supporting you know different youth and families and seeing where their their traumas kind of kind of uh, led. Um, I kept poking um, uh, Megan uh, because I was also a research scholar um, with her. I was like, hey, I'm really still interested in working with the trauma center. Like, I know I'm doing all this other stuff for the moment, right, to chase this dream. Um, but I still would love to be a part of the trauma center and specifically the rec center, right? Because even as a youth myself, um, sports is my go-to, right, away from whatever else is going on in life and supportive, you know, peers were my go-to. Um, so as I was, you know, once again, learning about the field, learning about folks, learning about myself, um, it was like, okay, how can I take this, not business-oriented mind, because it was a business at Monique Inc. Um, it was a consulting firm, but how can I be a little bit more granular and scholastic um, in my approach? So uh, that's when Megan and, you know, Jenny invited me on board, um, began to learn more about the, the processes there, and to be honest, I fell in love with it. I'm still loving it. So it's a very um, eclectic role, which I enjoy. It isn't too much of a repetitiveness, um, keeps me on my toes. I'm gonna get to learn from, from students as well and very intelligent colleagues. Hope that answers the question, kind of opened me up there. Thanks. Can <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you speak more to what is being taught in this training? Which training? I guess the ones that you're teaching my staff. <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah. You want to talk about the sure. stuff? Yeah. yeah. So actually, I have a training going on with uh, Trauma to Brain in about thirty minutes, and it's pretty much the, <laughs> the same, the same um, approach. Um, so ideally, uh, Dr. Bruce Perry he has an, he has a book called The Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog, and it goes through different case uh, different cases that he's worked uh, through within his uh, research, and it identifies different approaches on uh, whether that's dissociation. Uh, the stress response system, um, different ways of engaging with youth and families that have had some, you know, chronic stress or some some highly uh, toxic, you know, environment that they've been raised in. So the approach with the S threes now is we um, not only just introduce the book and talk about the content. Um, the goal is to pull from them what are some approaches that they can acknowledge to not only support the youth, but maybe you know, speak with their parents, speak with their other staff members that aren't in this training, right? Other rec staff. Um, to kind of get that ball going from the inside, while then the policy and the, uh, you know, those other, you know, systems are being worked on on the outside. So the um, initially, and if you can help me, um, initially when we did the all staff training back in 2018, well, all, let me step back. The training that we offer, and actually the, a lot of the programming we develop for students is rooted in the neurobiology of trauma and healing, um, while also incorporating like a person and environment perspective. So we're not talking solely about like the brains and bodies of kids who are impacted, but also what does it mean for the community? How can we use this information to help communities heal as well? So we started with kind of the basics of creating some definitions around trauma and adversity, prevalence nationally and in Cleveland. Um, but really it was, it, what the city wanted was very much skill focused. So they 
were identifying that within the rec centers, kind of what Megan was describing before, there were a lot of escalating behaviors from staff. So just not really having a sense of how to manage um, when kids were coming in and were getting activated or, um, you know, fights pop off in basketball games or whatever was going on there. They, they felt like there was some skill absent in being able to manage um, dealing with the kiddos and also dealing with one another. So like Megan mentioned, you know, they too are, are a pretty traumatized group. And so um, we did a lot of role playing. That was fun. Um, and a lot of kind of application stuff. So little bits of content and then what does this look like for you? What could you do differently? That kind of thing. Is there anything I'm leaving out? There are other components that we didn't do, but that were offered like conflict resolution training was one of them. And then um, another piece of it was really trying to build rec center. So I think they paired up rec centers that were patient based close to each other to try to create some support and they had monthly meetings that they were doing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> feedback on the parents of the children who are attending these and if they see any improvements in like their children and like the way they interact with them? Good. So we, um, we, our requirement working with the city is we had to work with the, the kids and the um, rec center go or they call them patrons, um, the people that go to the rec center. So we built in a lot of uh, focus groups to where we could get feedback into how we um, develop this tool. Um, there hasn't this type of organizational work is really hard to measure change because it happens so slowly. Um, and so like when we went into this, we told the city it's going to be at least three years before you see any change and training's not going to do it like you need to do organizational stuff. So from my knowledge, there hasn't been, there was a plan survey actually before the pandemic, but that got shifted because all the rec centers closed down. Um, and so that that one has sort of moved around in the scope of our work of, um, and we had a change of administration too, which changed our scope of work a bit. We've heard little bits from um, the S3s about the ways that kids are engaging in the recs yeah. um, in really positive ways. Um, I'm trying to think of examples. Well, I know even with Glenville around that time, That's um, right. when there was a there was a shooting and a life loss, um, I want to say what, three months ago is yeah. um yeah they, they actually uh you know had a like a visual event or something mm -hmm. around that um, and actually you know came together and kind of had a you know community bond you know moment um, so mm -hmm. that, that's one you know if you want to think of it from a community wide <laughs> yeah but, uh, as pertains to just you know more on the individual i think um uh, i think renetta keeps bringing up you know circumstances on you know some students that have were patrons rather that have transitioned from coming in, huffing and puffing to now, okay, mm -hmm. these are the steps. I'm a little bit more open to speaking and playing volleyball and things mm -hmm. like that. So. And more comfort with the S3s. So part of what I think was like a question mark for the city, um, they identified the RECs as a, as a potential place of healing and, and put these S3s into the RECs because again, that's a naturally occurring kind of setting for kids. And they were hopeful that it could remove some of the stigma around receiving mental health care. If that's just something that you do while you're there, if the S3 presents like any other staff person, you know, would they feel comfortable, maybe more comfortable than they might having to be, for example, pulled out of class um, to see a therapist at school. And, you know, we've heard just last month, we heard some really lovely stories of kids for whom like a crisis or an ex like extremely acute traumatic event, I think it was a, a suicide in one family. They knew that it had occurred. They had been hopeful that they'd be able to support the family, but the family just wasn't ready yet. Um, and just, I think last month, the sister of the boy who had passed sought out the S3 um, and they have been able to work together. I remember her saying that she 
the young lady was an artist and hadn't drawn since her brother had passed and just last month came in with a beautiful piece of art that she had created for um, the specialist. So it, it's, yeah, it's really like, there's magical stuff that happens. Yeah. Yeah. One question is you said that you you had thought or the thinking is to like bring, implement this in other places besides the rec center. And how do we get everybody around us to acknowledge that COVID was a trauma for everybody? And so really we're all on that scale and all kind of need to learn these tactics, not just at rec centers, but at hospitals or you know, anywhere, the printing store, whatever. I mean, just different places that need just as much as the kids do. Yeah, we stand on our soapboxes. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like that's something I constantly say to anybody, especially anybody that holds power or is a decision maker. Um, we saw the, the mass exit of the hospitals. We'd like, we identified that on day one. Um, of the pandemic, that this is going to be a huge issue. We wrote all these grants too to support mm -hmm. some of our intervention work, and the feedback we got back from reviewers of like, yeah, COVID's not going to have an impact. Like, it's not like this is not important. And now we have this massive shortage of hospital people because they're burned out because they experience trauma and secondary trauma in doing their work. Um, I think it's get, having people see the impact in in um, like how it relates to them. So we had a, uh, this is, I'm second hand telling a story from Amy Korsh. I think she was the one that was sitting in. She gave a presentation to a board of one of our local um, organizations. And there was a couple of the people in the room were like, oh, like, this isn't relevant to me. I'm a board member. I don't need, like, I'm not actually on the ground. Those people on the ground need to be knowing it. And throughout the presentation, they became more engaged because they saw the connections. And one of the individuals, I'm probably not gonna say this right. He owned like a, um, it was like a factory. And he was like, that explains like what's happening to my, my workers, like when they're coming in, when they're acting this way. And so then Amy was then invited to go do trauma trainings at, at the factory. a factory that did like car parts or something like that. And so it, it's the like helping people understand that we all have experienced some form of trauma. I mean, before it was 60 to 70%, now with the pandemic, 100% mm -hmm. of people have experienced some type of traumatic event in their life and understanding what that looks like and how we can shift as an organization and as people who work in those organizations, how can we work to not trigger or to exacerbate what's going on and how can we make it a more comfortable and we, I mean, we do a lot of community trainings and a lot of, of talks in the community. Um, and I think, you know, to be fully transparent, we're often asked to talk on a specific topic, um, but we just sneak it in. We just sneak it in there. Um, so like I did grand rounds for UH over the summer and they were curious about burnout, understandably. Um, but we're not framing it as having been related to COVID. People online are having trouble hearing. Oh, sound. Yeah, yeah I think you stand can back here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Closer to oh, there you go. That's so much more serious up here. <laughs> Is this better? <laughs> um, anyway, so they were not framing the burnout piece as being related to COVID and the additional strain that that had put on many of their, their providers kind of all over the map. Um, so I was able to build that piece into the grand rounds that I delivered. And I think, you know, people were floored. That was the first time they were hearing of a lot of this stuff, even secondary traumatic stress and how we kind of frame that as being an issue too. So, um, yeah, we'll go anywhere and talk to anybody who's <laughs> interested. And sometimes we'll build it in, even if they don't know they're interested, they usually end up being interested. Yeah, we, uh, I had a meeting during the pandemic around with uh, the East Cleveland School District, and they, they were requesting um, support for their youth, their kids in the school, because they were struggling. And in that meeting, um, I snuck it in um, where I could that, 
that your staff are also struggling too. And I started to describe it just in my own way. And I um, used Jenny in this example too, which we use in trainings too, of that during the pandemic where we would talk back and forth and one of us would be like, I'm having such a hard time putting my words together today, or I feel like I'm in such a fog. I'm like a little bit more snippy to my partner. Um, so all these pieces, like these are all indicators that we are, our stress systems are not operating in the way they should be um, linked to the pandemic. And so when I started talking about this, I could like, she was, she was super tense and just like really concerned about these kiddos. And all of a sudden I saw her like shoulders drop and relax. And she's like, yeah, that's what our staff are experiencing. And so rather than us working directly with the kids, we ended up working with the staff in the school and providing them with some of our trainings just around how to recognize um, what they're experiencing and what can they do about it. So that self-care, that self-keeping, that isn't like go do yoga for an hour, like micro moments of, of self-care, like fidget poison. and I mean, we're on the side of everybody. Needs for kids, is that what I mean? You're, like, you know, you're you're making a casserole and you're making sure you put the vegetables on it too. Is that kind of like yeah. Got it? Yeah, exactly. Just make it still taste good. <laughs> Anything online? Questions? Oh, you just typed that into the chat. I did. We sometimes share a brain. <laughs> <laughs> Anything Ivan or Emily or Chris want to add? Anybody want to get a doctorate degree? We a lot of first semester, first year students yeah, think I want to get this We'll talk about it. <laughs> Well, you have to get your master's first. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there we are. I have yeah. to finish this. Oh, rare. You're not alone. First step at a time. We won't rush out. So if yeah. you have like a one on one question or want to check in about anything, we can hang for a few. You are free to. <laughs> Drop in the brain in like five minutes or whatever that is. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you all so much. Oh, it's a I want to take this off, but it's so much drama. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. It's got a good one. I wasn't scared. You're fiddling. I just um, <laughs> but you told us. I'm not sure if I know that there were like some, um, I a lot of the process class is really good. Then if you're looking for the second, you know, portion, you can be like decertified. 